Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the university and for the inaugural lecture of Professor Penny Allen. I'm Barry MacDonald, the interim provost of the university, and it's my pleasure to host you here this evening. I'm standing in for the vice chancellor and have an apology from him. He's unable to be here, and we are clashing with a meeting of the university council, uh, which is considering the future governance arrangements for the university. So I should also apologise for the Chancellor, the Pro-Chancellor and the members of Council who also can't be here tonight. Inaugural lectures are an important part of university life. They celebrate recent appointments to the position of Professor and Professor Allen's research expertise on the relationship between science and design and designing for urban resilience, which you will hear about this evening illustrates the calibre of the staff that we have at Victoria University. Victoria is New Zealand's globally ranked capital city university. Being a capital city university provides our staff and our students with privileged access to the world of politics, government, diplomacy and the public sector, and also to legal, cultural, scientific, business, community and community organisations, as well as to the nation's archived heritage. Our civic engagement provides an opportunity for, to enrich national culture and to lead thinking on major social and environmental issues. It allows the university to play an important role in the development of public policy and to facilitate innovation, entrepreneurship and sustainable economic growth. Professor Allen's endeavours in establishing a clear and deep-seated relationship between science and design, remediating degraded urban spaces into vibrant, well-functioning urban areas and most recently designing for urban resilience sits well with Victoria's focus on contributing to some of the global challenges facing us today. Professor Allen, welcome. Joined Victoria University in 2007 as Program Director for the School of Architecture, a position that she still holds. Prior to this, she was based in Sydney as Principal of Hassel, a multidisciplinary design practice with offices situated around the world. Other professional positions include being National Vice President and Chair of the Education Committee at the Australian, Australian Institute of Landscape Architects and Director of Landscape Architecture at the Government Architects Office in New South Wales. Professor Allen's career in academic research and as a design practitioner has seen her receive many awards and distinctions. Most recently in 2013 for her work on earthquake cities of the Pacific Rim she received the Charlie Challenger Supreme Ward Award and the NZILA Excellence Award for Planning and Research. As her publications and awards suggest, much of Professor Allen's recent work has focused on the role of design in establishing and strengthening urban resilience and the design of models that go across traditional academic boundaries to solve complex urban problems. In her presentation, Professor Allen will discuss how bringing design into the debate about disasters and recovery can shift the way we think, the way we think about urban spaces and their systems. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Professor Penny Allen. given that you'd all be from quite diverse backgrounds. So although this lecture is about the relationship between designing cities, disaster and resilience, I've decided to start quite simply by designing my own garden. I'm doing this not simply because many people have an affinity with their own gardens. It's also because there are resonance, resonances between the way I design gardens and the way I design cities. At whatever, at whatever scale I'm designing, I'm interested in the interplay of systems, and so, by definition, I'm interested in resilience. So, at the front of my house in Breaker Bay, the mouth of the harbour, in one of the most inhospitable conditions in all of Wellington, I decided to make a garden. Oops. 
Instead of designing everything, filling the place with plants, I started to encourage gaps, lots of gaps, with different microclimates and different soil conditions. In the gaps, I experimented. I tried to plant a native hibiscus. Um, sorry, I, <laughs> sorry again. I tried to plant a native hibiscus, the beautiful hibiscus Nicolai. I ordered a plant and planted it, but it died in the first subtly. <laughs> I gave up on the idea of that beautiful shaggy plant in amongst the other coastal natives until one day, a couple of years later, it reappeared in a different gap. It's flowering now and has withstood every storm this winter. By making space and not being too pushy, I created the conditions for something to emerge on its own terms and in its own time. Cities are a bit like gardens. There are two opposing forces. On the one hand, the desire in the mind of planners for a certain amount of stability and identity, and on the other, the unpredictable force of nature. It's perhaps not surprising that these two forces correspond to what Julian Beinart Professor of Urbanism at MIT suggests are two of the three most influential normative urban models in history. The city is machine and the city is organism. The machinic model is most common when a settlement must be created hurriedly. It's about expediency and efficiency. The organic model, which inspired the garden city movement, sees the city as a living organism, self-referential, self-organizing, self-sustaining and self-repairing. I'm not here to promote either one. What's most interesting about these models is that they're a way of thinking about how a city might operate, how the parts fit together, and then how they relate. They also point to a problem with the design of cities. It's obvious that you need a designer or an engineer to make the parts of a machine work together efficiently. It's less obvious how a designer might be involved in encouraging a city to repair itself. And they're not binary opposites either. Like most cities, Wellington is a mixture of both models, a machinic grid designed halfway around the world, embellished with what would later be called garden city aspirations, and laid willfully over a topography that's the product of dramatic, cyclic, earthquake-related upheavals. Most contemporary cities developed through the 20th century with more attention paid to the machine than the organism. In Wellington, urban planning is driven more by market forces and the need to be efficient, and less about accommodating the uncertainties of organic life. This willfulness extends to the layout and placement of the city's urban pattern, which seems to have developed with very little regard to the underlying ground or the threat of earthquakes. <coughs> this has created a kind of accidental beauty, where the grid and the steep topography collide, but it's also made us vulnerable. The risk associated with life in the city was brought home to me emphatically when I arrived here from Sydney in 2007 as a new academic. I'd organised a seminar on designing cities to accommodate sea level rise. Someone in the audience said that there was likely to be a major earthquake in Wellington soon that would raise the ground, thereby cancelling any impacts of inundation. <laughs> I was fascinated. Not just one major threat, but two, <laughs> with opposing catastrophic earth-shaping impacts. It was a glib comment, but it's a great story. State Highway 1, our only escape route out of the city, sits right on top of a major fault. Oh, and so does most of the city's water supply, and the ferry terminal, and the Prime Minister's residence. For an urbanist and a landscape architect, the fact that the design of the city was actually contributing <coughs> to that risk was not just the knowledge gap that academics look for when identifying a new area of research. It was a yawning chasm, an underexploited opportunity for a city to reinvent itself and a new way to think about design. I thought, okay, here's my first question as a new academic. Is this disregard for the threat of earthquakes an anomaly? Do earthquakes shape the way we design and inhabit cities? After a period of initial research, I found that yes, they do a little, but with qualifications. Sometimes earthquakes can act as catalysts for urban change. For example, in earthquake-prone southern Italy in the 18th century, 
the town of Philadelphia was shifted to less risky ground and redesigned using contemporary rational planning models with wide gridded streets and open squares. Parts of Lisbon were reconstructed in the same way following the earthquake and tsunami of 1755. But these changes were made when monarchs and governors had absolute rule and were able to make sweeping changes with little resistance. In contemporary cities, sweeping change is difficult to achieve. For example, City Beautiful master planner Daniel Burnham in 1905 in San Francisco, who'd recently completed a master plan for that city, rushed back expect, expecting an immediate commission to implement the plan. Despite vigorous support from city councillors, the mayor quickly quashed the plan, suggesting that there were several obstacles to change, including the inertia of the government administration and the self-serving obstruction of property owners. Wellington has to contend with the fact that there hasn't been a major earthquake in living memory, although the earthquakes in Christchurch have made people sit up and take notice. But because it's hard to make structural change to an already built city for an event that may never happen, we continue to develop the urban form of the city, not because of, but in spite of the threat of earthquakes. We refer to the latest planning models. Jan Gell has had a very good go. We follow the seven seas. We act as though we live in a relatively benign environment. Our energies are thrown into prediction and protection, strengthening infrastructure and refining recovery and emergency management strategies so we can deal with the event as efficiently as possible and carry on. These are all good, solid, top-down strategies. They're all about centralised management and control. It works. But research is beginning to suggest that there's a problem with this approach. Because the impacts of many disasters are dispersed, and it's physically impossible to manage them all at once, the most effective and lasting recovery processes may not be about centralised control at all, but about sharing responsibility by co-opting expertise from the community. Top-down strategies that preempt or exclude community involvement can actually make us more dependent, more vulnerable, and therefore less resilient. At this point, it might be useful to consider what a resilient community looks like. According to Dr. John Twigg of University College in London, a resilient community has three characteristics. The capacity to absorb stress, the capacity to maintain basic structure and function during disaster, and the capacity to recover after an event. And Neil Adger and Dennis Maletti contribute a fourth characteristic, the capacity to self-organize, learn, and adapt without much outside assistance. A good but extreme example of a resilient community comes from 19th century Japan. Although Japan's disaster-prone capital on the other side of the Pacific lies on a major fault line and tremors are frequent, fire was by far the most common source of destruction in the 19th century. A conflagration that turned several blocks to ashes occurred in Edo, the capital, on average every five or six years. Since there was a seasonal rhythm to these events and the gap between them was short, Edo citizens learned to flee, then return and rebuild. They kept their belongings light and portable, and they lived in houses that were easily dismantled. With a population well prepared for disaster, destruction of property, even on this scale, was accommodated within the day-to-day -day management of the city. This was possible because the light physical infrastructure was matched by a strong and enduring social infrastructure. I'm interested in these three ideas. Light physical infrastructure, strong social infrastructure, and the accommodation of disturbance within the day-to-day -day management of the city, because they provide clues about how we might design for disaster. And for the remainder of this lecture, I'm going to talk about the implications and challenges of each one and their relationship to resilience. In Edo, it was the portability of the physical infrastructure that made it light. But in the contemporary city, it's hard to make physical infrastructure portable or light. Light, flexible systems require redundancy, which allows the system to absorb disturbance. It's the infrastructural equivalent of not putting all your eggs in one basket. 
but redundancy is expensive and it's not particularly efficient. Because we demand the efficient and streamlined provision of infrastructure services, there's usually a trade-off against redundancy and in favour of efficiency, which is fine until there's an unpredictable event. Unpredictable events are problematic for at least three reasons. First, because while infrastructure systems do incorporate a certain amount of redundancy, it's only to accommodate predictable disturbance. The problem is disturbances are becoming more intense and more unpredictable and in the infrastructure we have can't cope. Second, infrastructure is designed to operate as a highly connected system of parts. If one part fails, everything fails. When this happens in Wellington, it throws the city into chaos. Urban infrastructure, in other words, is designed to be fail safe and not safe to fail. Third, most infrastructure is invisible and disconnected from our daily lives. We tend not to think about where our food comes from or what we pour down the sink. It makes us careless, but it also makes us dependent and therefore more vulnerable. My neighbour put it in a nutshell. When I asked him if he'd ever thought about having a water tank, he said, why would I need a water tank when I can turn on the tap? <laughs> so we not only inhabit the hazard-prone landscape, with risky urban form, the urban infrastructure on which we depend is not entirely reliable. As first world urban dwellers, we've developed an unhealthy dependence on the machine. But there's another, more flexible infrastructure which we tend to ignore. The urban landscape, the ground on which a city sits, is inherently infrastructural. It mediates, produces, facilitates, and transports. Many cities were sited because of deep harbours, freshwater streams, productive forests, deep rich soils and sheltering hills. But with the rapid rise in population and the development of engineered systems to support that population, the need for landscape as a resource has diminished. At some point, urban ecosystems began to be seen as inefficient, dangerous, messy, unhygienic and space consuming. So trees were felled and streams were buried. Uh, this is a drawing of the streams in Wellington that have been buried. There's quite a few of them. But the ground that supported those ecological processes is still there. The work of a landscape architect consists in part of identifying that ground and trying to revive its connections to the much broader biophysical environment of which it's a part. So rather than seeing the urban landscape as a disparate collection of decorated spaces around buildings, landscape architects see the city's roads, lanes, car parks, vacant lots, parks, squares and leftover spaces instead as an interconnected matrix. Well, this is the figure ground of Wellington. So the black are the buildings and the white is the space in between. And if you reverse it with the black um, as uh, the ground, you can see how much of an interconnected matrix the urban landscape is. Much of my work as a designer has been about investigating how landscape can mediate between the urban and ecological, processing building waste, mitigating the heat island effect, absorbing and cleaning stormwater. This helps the city absorb stress and maintain function. It works, in other words, like an urban shock absorber. I'll give you an example. In Sydney in 1999, we won a design competition to create public domain for a new suburb for 3,500 people two kilometres from the heart of Sydney, on 24 hectares of decommissioned industrial land. The site capped an extensive network of wetlands extending from Oxford Street to Centennial Park to Botany Bay. It had once been a race course and had been bombed a couple of times to get rid of the layers of peat and water under the ground. Then it was capped entirely with concrete. Needless to say, the site had a problem with flooding. On our second site visit, we were standing up to our knees in water. The infrastructure was ancient and the only open water body left was the Alexandria Canal downstream, the most polluted water body in Sydney. Our plan was to integrate two very different and potentially antagonistic systems, the environmental and the urban, and make them interdependent so that the presence of one automatically enriched the other. 
Our strategy was to increase the permeability of the site and allow the water levels to rise and fall with the rain. We designed new linear urban wetlands that captured and cleaned the stormwater generated by the site. The water was stored and recycled for irrigation and water play. Buildings were designed to be low enough so that the sunlight could reach the plants, even in the dead of winter. To influence the design of urban form and buildings in the surface of landscape was at that time relatively unusual. But the developer bought it because he could see that the people that came to live there would love the plants and the water and the light in the middle of the city, and in fact would pay a premium for it. And they did, and everyone was happy. This coupling of the urban and the ecological is a useful design strategy. It expands the boundaries of both systems, giving each room to move. It deals with the everyday, while also making provision for future unspecified needs by overlapping and multiplying opportunities for environments, for people, for cities. It helps to lighten infrastructure, absorbing disturbance and maintaining urban function. This kind of soft or green infrastructure, as it's now called, is nothing new. Frederick Law Olmsted was doing it a century ago in Boston with his design for the Back Bay Fence. <coughs> it is particularly uh, popular at the moment. It could be found around the world. Coupling, for example, agriculture and learning in China, or landfill waste and recreation in Spain. So given the flexibility and resources inherent in the urban landscape and a growing interest in how other city earthquake prone cities managed, I posed the next question. In the event of an earthquake, assuming that buildings and infrastructure will sometimes fail, what kind of auxiliary functions do urban landscapes provide to assist recovery? Between 2009 and 2010, Martin Bryan and I traveled to a number of cities. San Francisco, Conception, and Kobe on the so-called Ring of Fire to find out. In each city, we mapped the relationship between urban form and the biophysical environment. We gathered from local archives and interviews first-hand accounts of events in each city in the first few days before help arrived. This evening, I'll describe what we found in two of those cities. San Francisco was initially established as a small Spanish mission, a harbor port for traders, and a military outpost before the 1840s gold rush precipitated massive immigration. In 1839, the Mexican magistrate regularized the settlement beside the bay with a gridiron street pattern and a central plaza. The layout of small blocks and wide streets gave no concession to the sometimes steep topography. Over the next 50 years, subdivision expanded. The wetlands of the bay were reclaimed and developed for housing. Neighborhood centers developed in the saddles between the hills, and parks were set aside on the hilltops, the least accessible and therefore less valuable land, until a groundswell of public-spirited citizens lobbied for the establishment of a thousand-acre park on the edge of the city. On April the 18th at 5.12 a.m., the city of approximately 500,000 people woke to a magnitude 7.7 .7 earthquake that left many houses uninhabitable and utility services in disarray. Some fled the city, but a large proportion remained, gathered in parks and open space. Ad hoc camps were established, and shelter was constructed using whatever was available. A few months later, Major General Greeley, charged with the recovery of the city, suggested that the question of providing temporary shelter for the 200,000 homeless people who remained in San Francisco was facilitated by the considerable numbers of convenient squares and public grounds. In fact, San Francisco's entire urban structure, its wide gridded streets, hilly topography, and extensive and generous network of parks all contributed in some way to the recovery process. The parks supported a diversity of everyday functions. Immediately after the earthquake, they were widely dispersed. Because they were widely dispersed, they became centers for communication and solace for local communities. Because many of the, of the parks were elevated, they allowed locals to assess the threat of advancing fire. In the camps, a few days later, people were resourceful and spirits in general were high. Kitchens, restaurants, and all types of commerce flourished. The city streets were another important locus of recovery. The wide diagonal of Market Street 
connected directly to the recently strengthened ferry wharf, allowed a quick escape to those outlying suburbs less affected by the earthquake. Elsewhere, the width and redundancy of streets facilitated access. If certain streets were impassable, the grid provided alternative options. The wide streets also encouraged the rapid resumption of commercial activities. By allowing makeshift shop fronts to be erected directly in front of damaged ones. They also facilitated new auxiliary infrastructure, such as water and sewer pipes and heavy rail. Local streets became important community spaces. Due to broken chimneys, all food of the entire city was cooked over campfires in the open streets. The families cooked <coughs> together and sometimes the whole street was invited to dinner. An alternative city evolved as communities quickly adapted to life without much input from the authorities. Once relief started to arrive in the form of food, tents <coughs> and money, the capacity for resourcefulness was somewhat curtailed by a very strict rule of law and a lot of bureaucratic red tape. Conception. When La Perouse arrived in the Bay of Conception during his exploration of the South American coastline in 1786, he encountered a coastal outcrop of mountains linked to the mainland mountains by a low-lying isthmus of marshlands, lagoons, rivers, streams, and low hills. <coughs> by the time he arrived, Penco, the capital, was in ruins after repeated tsunamis and had re relocated to La Moca, a town defined and contained by forested hills and marshes and laid out on a grid of streets <coughs> and a series of public squares that ran down to a freshwater stream. The town was renamed Conception and has since grown to become the second largest city in Chile. The city has sprawled over this landscape, constrained by its wetlands, resulting in a polycentric city. The central city, universities and hospitals are located to the north of the river. The dormitory suburbs and secondary schools occupy the hills and broad coastal plains to the south. And industrial lands and port activities lie to the west. Three bridges span the river and a series of roads and a railway line cross the marshy landscape connecting the port to the central business district. On February the 27th at 3.34 a.m., an 8.8 .8 earthquake, one of the strongest in modern history, struck the coast of Chile. Its epicentre was 100 kilometres north of Conception. For the first few days, all services, including communications, were down and the world was unaware of the damage to the city. A period of extreme civic unrest followed that local police were powerless to suppress as the population fought for access to food, water and safety on high ground. Four tsunami waves beginning at 3.48 a.m. hit the coast near the city throughout the early morning. Many residents from the poorer suburbs on the coastal lowlands south of the river fled to the settlements in the hills and camped on the side of the road and in vacant lots. In response, the local residents barricaded themselves in as looting escalated and the situation became violent. To the north of the river, many people camped outside for fear of aftershocks or because their homes were damaged. Campsites were chosen because they were close to home, had rudimentary services or because they were known to the community as places to camp after an earthquake. Access to water was critical in the first few days, so parks with lagoons, riverbanks, natural springs or streams near the city filled up quickly. A striking feature of this period was the way small communities formed spontaneously, first for security and then to devise strategies to procure food, water and medicine. On the metropolitan scale, difficulties with access and connection were perhaps the biggest barrier to long-term recovery. Two of the three bridges crossing the Biobio River had collapsed. People injured on the south side of the river couldn't reach the hospitals in the north. Debris piled up in city streets because the designated refuse area was in the south. This has implications for Christchurch as it begins to develop its new polycentric city across similar marshy ground. So it's clear to us from these case studies that the urban landscape unequivocally enhanced the community's capacity to recover. And although each city recovered in its own way, we could draw conclusions about certain types of urban landscape that were particularly useful. These included a diversity of dispersed urban spaces, redundancies in connectivity, local and widely dispersed ecosystem services, 
and local urban spaces that could quickly be adapted to encourage communication and response. These kinds of landscapes can provide the tools or the raw materials for recovery after a disaster. However, what was for, what was for us even more interesting was the spontaneous emergence of strong social infrastructures and how, in the absence of top-down recovery operations, adaptive behaviours emerged on their own. Not only did people manage to find food and water and medicine, they manipulated their urban environment to improve communication and create manageable communities that made resourcing easier. This kind of behaviour is much more apparent when a community is under stress. That's why third world cities are such important laboratories for researchers studying resilient human behaviour. Press pressure caused by lack of space, money, services, overpopulation, or the stress created by a natural disaster stimulate innovative response. The common denominator seems to be the absence or temporary withdrawal of top-down urban processes, which can dampen bottom-up initiatives. So, we have a number of problems. We know there are things we can do now to reduce vulnerability, but making change now is hard. It costs money, and politicians tend to be more invested in short-term cycles rather than long-term visions. It's difficult to activate the relationship between the physical and the social in the everyday environment without artificially manufacturing stress. And design is usually seen as a top-down process and more appropriate after an event than before. But if we shift our thinking about what design can do, if we treat design like a small disturbance or a grain of sand in an oyster shell, could potentially encourage incremental day-to-day -day change without much effort but with maximum effect. This kind of approach could enrich the lives of people now while automatically enhancing their capacity to self-organise, learn and adapt without much outside assistance. This has big implications for research in the pre-disaster space. I'll give you some examples. First, design has the capacity to act as a catalyst Catalytic projects are attractors. They acknowledge complexity without destroying it. Like a magnet dropped into a big bed of iron filings, they can encourage the reorganization of urban forms and patterns from the bottom up. The most famous contemporary example of catalyt catalytic design is the High Line in New York, which stimulated the regeneration of an entire district in Manhattan. It attracted billions of dollars in investment, but it also gave people a sense of a new way to inhabit the city. The image in this slide tells the story of a woman in a tenement block next to the High Line who got so tired of people looking in her window that she decided to give a nightly cabaret performance. <laughs> the Metro Cable Transport System in Caracas is also well known. It was designed by engineers and architects to transport thousands of workers each day from the favelas to the city centre. Instead of the original design solution for a six-lane highway that would have demolished whole swathes in formal settlements, the architects proposed a much more modest infrastructural solution with a minimal footprint. The cable cars have encouraged from the bottom up new housing for locals, by locals, and using locally found materials. But catalysts don't need to be big to create an impact. The jump structure on the waterfront wasn't expensive to build. It's a beautiful design, but perhaps more importantly, it's been a dramatically successful catalyst for community, and it's provoked an important and long overdue public debate about the quality of water in the harbour. <laughs> Second, design has the capacity to frame what's sometimes called hard edge and soft centre. Diego Ramirez Lovering noticed this phenomenon when he took RMIT students to Guadalajara. There, the traditional Spanish urban grid acts as cover for all kinds of illegal but life-supporting ad hoc development. The hard edge of the grid and the relative invisibility it affords encourages locals to respond creatively to the exigencies of day-to-day -day life in the disenfranchised neighborhoods of the city. The hard edge creates stability and identity because it persists over time. This persistence encouraged a more nuanced, encourages a more nuanced 
a more nuanced, adaptive and short-term response to everyday stresses without the entire system collapsing. Harder Soft Center is a really good tool when designing for disaster and a number of our master students have used it as a way of providing identity and core functions for a community. Ben Alnat, for example, designed an educational institution in an abandoned quarry on the Kabaddi coast. His scheme provides the employment, energy and life that institutional buildings can bring to a town. But Plan Beehive can also house parliament in the event of a major earthquake in Wellington. The structural frame or hard edge of the building makes it flexible. A plate girder bridge supported by two large base you know, isolated cores <coughs> ground the building into the quarry. Floors float free within the large exoskeleton, creating one giant flexible space. The hard edge of the exoskeleton allows a critical service to be supplied in the event of a catastrophic earthquake, but it also kickstarts a failing economy, whether or not an earthquake happens. A third capacity of design is, speculative, is its speculative capacity. Rather than producing a piece of built work designed from a brief commissioned by a developer in response to a planning or policy, design can be used as a research tool. Because it's integrative and holistic as well as intensely visual, it's a good way to imagine futures and then test them through design. It can inform rather than be informed by policy. There are a number of entrepreneurial design practices working in this way, particularly since the economic recession. But perhaps the most well-known example of speculative design is the Rising Currents exhibition. In 2010, the Museum of Modern Art in New York organized a workshop exhibition to address the issue of sea level rise. Five interdisciplinary design teams were asked to redesign a location of New York to accommodate sea level rise. The underpinning of the design work was soft infrastructure, artificial islands, wind farms, oyster beds, absorptive wetlands. The designs investigated the potential for natural water processes to interact with the city rather than keeping it at bay through seawall and storm barriers. The teams worked over an eight-week period during which time there were a number of open days when city officials, scientists and the general public visited the design teams. Even before the projects were completed, the workshop had catalyzed a public and professional following in considerable discussion in the media. A six-month exhibition displayed the work, the galleries were filled, a book followed. The whole process has been internationally acclaimed as a successful way to expose creative people's role in the experimental nature of research with meaningful outcomes. The outcomes included a rich and complex array of possibilities and general public with the will and desire to get behind these initiatives in a proactive, non-regulatory environment. As Cyril Stanley Smith so eloquently put it, humans need to adapt to new conditions, and to do so we need to change minds. To change minds, art, images, and design will lead the way, more so than politics or science. Most of my research in the last two or three years has focused on a speculative design practice called research practice called Outpost, co-founded in 2012 with Martin Bryan and Sam Kebble, and based in the School of Architecture. We have a number of talented master students working with us every year on a range of projects. Most of the projects are concerned with investigating what it means to design resilience. We communicate this work for discussion to a wider audience through regular exhibitions and publications. We've also been working with REMO, the Wellington Regional Emergency Management Organization, on an open space recovery plan for Wellington City. And this is the design example I want to end on. Oops. We found a gap in the research. We'd mapped the available and useful open space in the city for this project, but we hadn't considered what would happen after the initial phase of recovery. Would the city just resettle in the same vulnerable urban patterns? We're currently working with students, using Island Bay as a case study, to investigate the potential of the blue line to act not just as a marker in the case of tsunami, but also as a seed for change. The proposal is to encourage the two-dimensional and sometimes virtual blue line here to emerge as a three-dimensional physical presence, a piece of physical environment, environmental and social infrastructure that will act as a catalyst 
to provoke a shift away from the vulnerable coastal edge. Small, precise, targeted moves will encourage other things to happen. Simply placing a seat, or a wall to lean on, or planting a garden might be enough to bring the community together and thereby bring the line more sharply into focus. It's a way to connect people with each other and people with place. Parts of the line could be used to collect and store water, to grow food, to connect backyard habitats to the greenbelt, to walk and bike, to just hang out, to check the view, to sit in the sun. The idea resolves a number of issues through a simple framework that enriches the life of the suburb on an everyday basis, as well as providing refuge and resources in case of emergency. And it prepares the suburb for lasting change should a catastrophic disaster occur by creating a core of amenity and services around which the, suburbs could re the suburb could resettle. So the aim of this lecture has been to discuss how we might design for disaster. It suggests that design can act as an important link between urban form, urban landscape, vulnerability, vulnerability, recovery and resilience. It shows how, as inhabitants of a risky city, we might use the design of the everyday to move forwards, to be ready. There are a number of things we can do. First, we can realign or at least create alternatives to our most vulnerable urban forms to make them less vulnerable. And I know that since the earthquakes in Christchurch, work has begun in these areas. For example, Wellington Water is looking at diversifying the supply of water at a number of different scales, including connecting the Petoni Aquifer to Wellington CBD with a pipeline under the harbour and providing point sources of potable water on a 500 metre grid across the city. Second, we could seriously engage with the potential of the urban landscape to absorb disturbance. This is more difficult than the first point because it requires a shift in thinking about what landscape is and what design can do in government, in planning and policy and among en engineers who deal with infrastructure and services. For the landscape to act as an effective shock absorber, we need to see it not as a collection of disparate leftover spaces, decorated spaces around buildings, but the expression on the urban ground of much more extensive ecologies that extend way beyond the city's political boundaries. We need to understand and respect those ecologies and do what we can to maintain their health and integrity. Third, we need to reactivate a community's relationship with the landscape and the resources it offers. Design can help in this respect by retrofitting cities incrementally with the backing of the community in the relative calm of a pre-disaster environment. This means we don't need to wait for the devastation of a disaster. We can act now. This kind of design is about making use of what's already there. It's about adjusting, encouraging redundancies, making space and creating opportunities. And it relies on the capacity of a system to self-organize in its own way and in its own, own time. The spatial strategies referred to in this essay, for example, coupling, frameworks, catalysts and speculation, are useful in this regard. Finally, there is very little funding for design research in this country. For some reason, design is not seen as a form of research at all. Everything is geared towards scientific research that produces policy that then influences planning, which may or may not end in design. I suggest we need to reverse our thinking. Design is integrative and close to the ground. It can test ideas before they even become policy. It can translate innovation and science directly into innovative spatial solutions that positively influence the way we live. Design should be informing policy in this country. So in the absence of serious funding, designers need champions, visionaries who can see the benefit that design can bring to the health and well-being of urban communities. And we all need to be supporting those visionaries because they're working against the grain. The design projects described this evening are a bridge between spatial design and recovery, the everyday and the extraordinary. They show that adapted cities are unique, the innovative and original expressions of a vigorous and vital relationship between the environment, the community, and unpredictable disturbance. An adapted city is flexible, alive, and open to the world, rather than insular and protected and its inhabitants show a remarkable capacity to respond, to learn, and to innovate. Much like that beautiful hibiscus Nikolai in my front garden.
Provost, professors, fellow academics, university staff, welcome guests and friends. I'm Robin Skinner, the Dean of Architecture and Design, and it gives me great pleasure to propose the vote of thanks to Professor Allen here at her inaugural lecture tonight. Landscape architecture is a global discipline with over 70 national associations. However, it remains a somewhat murky discipline in many people's thought. It's clearly not a sub-discipline of architecture, nor is it to be confused with landscape, it's the landscape design. So it's especially rewarding here tonight to learn more about the discipline and, and how landscape architects connect with the broad biophysical environment. Importantly tonight, Penny, you've helped us to understand landscape architecture's transformative power in society. Professor Allen's provocative pr pr proposition on how we can plan for post-disaster situations involves a radical rethink of how we can design the urban environment. She's communicated her understanding of the or organic operation of the city and how design can facilitate an urban landscape that can repair itself in a post-disaster situation. Seeing this landscape as an agent for recovery and providing for the emergence of adaptive behaviours will create conditions that will allow solutions to emerge as productive alternatives to, to traditional top-down design solutions. Penny, tonight you've presented us with a strategy that will allow communities to self-organise, to realign and to adapt. Where landscape can operate as a shock absorber and reactivate our, our relationship with the community and beyond in potentially very fraught times. This is an exciting prospect. Now, following the usual convention at inaugural lectures, there will be no questions. And instead, I invite you all to join together outside the theatre for refreshments where the conversation can continue and where we can further thank Professor Allen on her very rewarding presentation.